Welcome to the Molecular Therapy Podcast. I'm Dr. Rory Bricker-Anthony, Scientific Editor of the Molecular Therapy Family of Journals. This episode features a conversation between Dr. Roland Herzog, Editor-in-Chief of Molecular Therapy and Professor of Pediatrics at Indiana University, and Dr. David Schaefer, Hubbard Howe Jr. Distinguished Professor, Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, Bioengineering, Molecular and Cell Biology, and the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute at the University of California at Berkeley, and Dr. Adam Schifrek, Postdoctoral Scholar, California Institute for Quantitative Biosciences, University of California at Berkeley. They will discuss a recent article published in the February issue of Molecular Therapy by Dr. Schaefer and Schifrek and colleagues titled Evolving Membrane-Associated Accessory Protein Variants for Improved Adeno-Associated Virus Production. But before we get started, we are now mere weeks away from ASGCT's 27th annual meeting, Cell and Gene Therapy's must-attend event, held in Baltimore, May 7th through 11th. The meeting can be overwhelming, but ASGCT has developed a tool to help. ASGCT's session paths provide hour-by-hour paths for six of the most popular categories for attendees, including first-timers. Check them out at annualmeeting.asgct.org slash session paths. Finally, ASGCT members save $385 on registration rates for the annual meeting, whether you're attending in person or virtually. That's a bigger savings than the cost of membership itself, by the way. Bundle both ASGCT membership and annual meeting attendance and save big on attending the premier event in the field. Register today at annualmeeting.asgct.org. And now, Drs. Roland Herzog, David Schaefer, and Adam Schiefrecht. Adam, David, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you about your research paper that just came out uh, last month in molecular therapy. A really exciting paper. It is receiving a lot of attention at the website, lots of downloads, lots of uh, folks reading it. And, you know, it's fascinating to me for somebody who's also working on AV vectors that this recombinant virus is now so widely used in human gene therapy. And the original sequence of the AB zero type 2 vector, uh, or at that time wild type virus that was then converted into a vector, was actually sequenced and published about four decades ago. And the field is still finding in this small viral genome of less than 5 KB new proteins being encoded. So that is fascinating in itself. And now we're here, I guess, to talk about one of these, which is MAP, or the membrane-associated accessory protein, uh, that has just only recently been discovered and seems to play an important role in the fate of uh, what happens to that virus as it replicates and is being produced. uh, That has enormous implications for uh, the applications of, of gene therapy and, and production of these vectors. And now your paper is um, uh, showing us a new way how, how one can take advantage of, of these discoveries. So maybe one of you can explain just a little bit more to us what exactly this protein does in the life cycle of AAV and, and how that is important when making these recombinant viruses. Yeah, for sure. I think I can take that one. So MAPE is, you know, an acronym for the Membrane Associated Accessory Protein. 
And it was serendipitously discovered by uh, George Church's group in 2019 when they were looking at the the fitness landscape of the AV cap region. And they found that within a certain 119 amino acid encoding uh, stretch within the cap gene, there, any silent mutation that was silent in the VP1 open reading frame actually had a negative fitness on the the viral replication. And so why would silent mutations confer a fitness defect? And so as it turns out, there was a, an overlapping open reading frame that begins translation of a of the new MAPE protein from a near cognate or CTG star codon. And this is something we're kind of learning more and more about in in the field of virology, finding more examples of these uh, near cognate star codons and overlapping open reading frames expressing proteins that actually have really high fitness for the virus, f- functional effects. And so in the case of MAPE, it's a non-structural protein and it's present across the natural AV serotypes and several other groups, in, including our recently published corroborative data have followed up on this and shown that uh, MAPE plays a functional role in uh, the kinetics of AV production and secretion. And when you knock out MAPE, it decreases AV's association with exosomes and it slows the secretion of AV and it potentially might even affect the ratio of the of the three structural proteins. And so uh, I totally agree that this, um, you know, the discovery of a new AV protein this this many years later, especially when you think about how small and simple and well-studied AV's genome is relative to some of the other viruses that we study is really pretty remarkable. Yeah, I suppose you could say it was hiding in plain sight. Uh, just, uh, again, that, yeah, that by itself is remarkable. Um, so now with your specific study, now what we have a little bit of background of what this molecule does. Um, can you explain what was it your objective? You know, how did you, you know, what, where did you want to go from here? What was your, the question you asked? And then you, uh, obviously employed a, a molecular evolution type strategy, which, a lot of us have heard about quite extensively, especially and David is one of the pioneers of, of this kind of approach, but not everybody is so super familiar with the details of it. So maybe you can uh, explain a little bit how it worked. And I'm also curious, in, in this particular study, this approach worked extraordinarily well. Uh, was there something about this particular study that predisposed it to that kind of success or something intrinsic there that would help you employ this approach so successfully. Sure. Um, well, let me first off say that we're very, we're thrilled and gratified to be here talking with you, Roland. So very much appreciated. Uh, so we, you know, as Adam had mentioned, uh, the, the MAP or the MAP protein had been, you know, there was speculation or, or hypothesis within the field that it played a role in you know, egress or release of the virus or some some step in the viral life cycle associated with replication and release. And uh, we began to, uh, you know, over the past few years, take an interest in applying some of the technologies we developed to AV manufacturing or AV production. You know, we'd previously been focused a lot on delivery on the capsid and then turned our sights um, to an extent into AV production or manufacturing since that's a significant challenge within the field. Uh, so we then, um, you know, typically with, with directed evolution, we've been creating very, very large libraries, genetic variants of the virus and, um, packaging those variants into particles where the property of the virus is somehow, you know, connected to the DNA encoding that property. So in the case of capsid, we genetically diversified the particle, the AV capsid, and then, um, it contains inside of it the DNA that encodes that capsid. So there's a linkage between the, Phenotype, the property we're trying to select for, and the genotype, you know, the DNA encoding that property. So um, Adam adapted that strategy to look at the MAP protein uh, by linking the genotype. You know, he created a, a variant library um, of, of the MAP protein by doing error-prone PCR, 
connecting that to the phenotype, where in this case we were selecting not for delivery like we did with Capsid, but for the ability of the AAV to package within a cell and, and then get released from that cell. So um, in particular, after he had packaged the genetic library of the MAP variants into AAV particles, he infected just 293 cells in culture, uh, enabled the virus to, to replicate. And within that, within a given cell, if there were a variant of the MAP protein that conferred a selective advantage to the AV, um, a better ability to package or get released from the cell, then that would result in more viral particles being harvested from that cell and correspondingly an increase in the frequency of that variant genotype, uh, the DNA encoding that MAP variant within the pool. So, you know, I guess I would say there were a couple of, um, advantageous benefits that we got from the strategy that he developed. One was that, you know, we were, what we wanted to do is select for increased prevalence of a variant within a pool in Darwinian fashion. And this is selecting directly for something that impacts viral replication. So it reads out very directly into an increased prevalence, a competitive advantage for, for a variant within the pool. And then the second is that in the work that we've been doing with delivery, Often the selection has been getting increasingly complex over the years. You know, we do delivery now into non-human primates, and each one of those rounds takes, you know, a considerable amount of time, uh, you know, weeks or months. In this case, the selection, because it was for replication or packaging, could be done directly within HEC293 cells and culture, which just made the iteration really fast and really efficient. Wow. So, and then I noticed in your paper, that you honed in on a, on, on a specific amino acid that seemed to be really critical. Maybe you can explain that part of that aspect of the study a little bit. Yeah, so I can take that one. I guess, first off, I'd be remiss if I didn't give uh, Hunchul Lee, a fellow group member, credit uh, for really helping on this part of the study. But after selecting those map variants in the way that Dave described, we you know, analyzed by next generation sequencing the variants that had confer or been most enriched during that time and, and which correlates to, uh, in some cases, how, how well they were helping AV package. And so we took a handful of the most enriched variants, the variants that occurred at, at the most increased frequencies following selection, and we set off to individually test them by incorporating them and stably expressing them from hex cells to make stable cell lines so that we could test the effects of AV packaged in their presence relative to other variants or wild type or, or no MAPE. And um, so, some mutational features were really highly enriched. So, for example, something that came up a lot, which corroborates... Uh, some findings that other groups have found is that there were early stop codons resulting in C-terminal truncations of the protein. These seem to get enriched. There were, and then there were some examples, as you alluded to, of the of frame shift mutations resulting in an entirely new C-terminal domain, um, and some examples of point mutations that were enriched. And, and so of all these, uh, you know, these handful of, of variants that we isolated and systematically tested, one of them, which we call SL08, seemed to confer the, the most increased overall AV packaging and some other, uh, beneficial improvements to the quality of the capsules as well. And, and this was a really unique variant in that it was, uh, it was littered with some point mutations, and it had a frame shift that went into the uh, chunk of the cap gene in addition to some of these uh, point mutations. And so, you know, we we haven't really fully dissected out exactly which of these features confer those improvements, but it was a really interesting finding, and that was kind of our systematic approach to honing in on the, on the best variants. So now that you have created this... Uh these variants of the cap, or I'm uh, sorry, of the um, MAP protein that would allow you to get better secretion of this virus uh, out of the producer cells. And you've actually shown that this works, uh, this approach actually is applicable to multiple serotypes. Um, so, which is important, right, for the field because it means that it's fairly, the principle is 
widely applicable. Do you have a sense uh, what that will mean for for AV manufacturing um, and manufacturing of, of you know clinical grade vectors? I, I'd imagine it's going to make things in some ways you know quite a bit easier for for these kinds of processes. And do you expect now some of the you know producers of large scale uh, AV preps for for that go into people to, to change a bit there, the manufacturing scheme. We, we certainly hope so. You know, the, as a result of increased productivity and, you know, potentially secretion as well, uh, we, you know, we're anticipating or hoping that, uh, this variant is going to make it a bit easier to make a lot more AV from, for example, especially 293 cells. So, uh, as you well know, you know, the two dominant manufacturing platforms for AV, for AV are, uh, mammalian cell, typically 293, and then insect. And, uh, you know, the, the typical manufacturing platform of the state of the art is, you know, for example, the Icellus 500, uh, bioreactor, which cultures 293 cells adherent onto 500 meters squared of, of, uh, surface area within that system, within that, um, platform. And, uh, you typically generate on the order of 10 to the 16th viral particles per run of an Icellus, you know, after downstream processing. And in situations where we're looking at vector, especially that is administered systemically, that means that, you know, a single Icellus bioreactor run needs to be done per patient. Or in some cases, you know, the results of several Icellus bioreactors would need to be pooled together uh, to, to administer to a single patient. So uh, I think that there's a, a lot to be gained within the field for focusing on manufacturing and getting improved AV productivity. Uh, I'm hoping that delivery is going to continuously get better so that, you know, the dosages could potentially go down, which will spare manufacturing. But in, you know, in parallel, I think there's a lot of room for engineering the cell and, and engineering the buyers for better productivity. So, uh, we hope that, uh, you know, the contribution that, that we've made to MAP, um, results in improved AAV production, which will, you know, I think translate to better access to patients and potentially more affordable access. So we'd be, you know, happy to work with, for example, um, CDMOs, uh, so that potentially this technology or, or other manufacturing technology like it, becomes broadly accessible to the field. Yeah, I mean, to me, it seems quite obvious that it should, that S approach should bring costs down. I'm also wondering if it will help uh, with purity of, of these products, since uh, you don't have to break the cells open and have all that, you know, to deal with. And you already mentioned uh, the different production platforms, and I was wondering since it affects the pathway of the virus coming out of the cells through exosomes, and, and I don't know how all that compares between mammalian cells and insect cells. So do you have a sense whether the, how applicable this uh, finding is to producing AV in, in, in insect cells with, with the Bacolos system? Uh, we don't know. We haven't looked yet. Uh, that's a so simple, simple response. You know, since MAP affects steps of the AV life cycle, they're not completely elucidated yet. And since we don't know whether those, you know, steps of the life cycle would be very similar within an insect cell versus a mammalian cell, yeah, we don't yet know or can't can't speculate or hypothesize as to whether the same variants would be equally efficacious within insect cells. And a related question, um, the virus that is secreted, um, or the vector that is secreted, and that's then uh, harvested uh, for you know, in vivo gene transfer, for example, is there a difference in infectivity of these viral particles versus those that are still contained in the cells using the traditional method of breaking open cells and extracting virus from there? Are, are there differences in infectivity or are they, they're approximately comparable? Yeah, so that's an incredibly interesting question that I, I don't think it's been answered. There might, there might be work from other groups on this of which I'm not aware, but as far as I can tell, it's not really answered. I think, I think some of the things we do know is, you know, in the context of AV manufacturing, as we mentioned earlier, secreted vectors, uh, can result in higher recovery after the downstream purification processes. And the better vector that you have starting out with, the more you can recover downstream. And so those early observations of map of, of the mate affecting the kinetics of secretion, this was 
which is a really advantageous property of manufacturing, provided a lot of rationale for doing that. And we also know that some AV serotypes like AV9 are known to secrete at high percentage of the vector genomes, whereas others such as AV2 uh, do not. And so, yeah, a big question is just within that, that single serotype, is there differences between the secreted versus the cellular retained uh, pellets? And we, we have evidence that that MAPE can actually affect these qualities. So we have observed different MAPE variants to affect the specific infectivity of the secreted fraction of AVs. And we haven't tested this for the cellular AV fraction, so it'd be really interesting to see whether that differs or if that improvement is the same. And we've also observed map the MAPE variants to affect the full empty capsid ratios of the cellular AV. And in a different groups reported some evidence that that may, may affect the ratio of the three structural proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3. So these these differences in in the ratio of, of the structural proteins could be a potential hypothesis for the underlying mechanism for these differences in the specific infectivity and full to empty capsid ratios. But um yeah, so I would say there, there's definitely evidence that MAPE can affect these these properties, but whether these qualities differ between the secreted versus the cellular fractions, I think definitely deserves some some more attention. It does. It seems to me like from the data that you published and, and what others have have reported uh, on this map protein that those serotypes that are officially secreted and now you making this process even better that the virus you get out of, that, that the extracellular viruses that you're harvesting are actually quite infectious and that if, if anything, that you're making uh, this better and more advantageous for human gene therapy. So that all looks really promising. So going from here, maybe I can ask a question to, to David. Um, where do you see the, the AV field go? Um, you think we'll... We'll find uh, even more hidden proteins in that small genome or other functions that we did not appreciate, uh, maybe on the RNA level, uh, who knows? And, you know, where, where do you see that whole, you know, vector engineering slash manufacturing? Uh, where, where, where do you see the, the, um, hot areas in maybe over the next couple of years? Yeah, as, as you well know from your, your terrific work with AAV, um, it's a fascinating virus. And, you know, as, as we know, the capsid 25 nanometers is, uh, relatively tiny and it can only fit in that 5 kb worth of, uh, you know, 4.7 kb of genome. So it has to be an extremely economical virus <laughs> to be able to encode as much function as it possibly can within that limited real estate that can fit into the capsid. So, uh, I think, you know, Church's discovery of MAP and then there's the X protein and, and other ones, um, AAP. Uh, those are, you know, the three that, that are being studied so far. I'm sure that other people are looking for open reading frames and rep and, and in other regions of the virus. But, uh, you know, who, who knows what remains to be discovered? Uh, I don't think we're probably seeing the end yet of, of alternate proteins encoded from AAP. Uh, you know, speaking at a higher level about the field, you know, our field as a whole, I think, has been very focused on delivery for a number of years, you know, which which makes perfect sense because, you know, for a gene therapy, if you can't deliver it, there is no therapy. And I think there's been an increasing amount of momentum uh, within the field. You know, uh, we've seen F5 FDA approvals of AV gene therapies to date. I think a lot more along the way. And delivery, I think, is on a is on a good path. There are lots of unsolved problems, but but delivery, I feel, is on a good path. So. If, you know, thinking optimistically ahead as we're going to have more and more FDA approvals, the bottleneck potentially can become that manufacturing, that we have great products, but we can't make enough of them because the doses are still relatively high. Delivery is going to produce the doses over time, I think. But we are, we are already hitting bottlenecks where it's difficult to produce enough material for a patient or for an indication. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the joke in the field for a number of years was there are only three problems in gene therapy, delivery, delivery, and delivery. 
I think we're going to hit a point where it's going to be delivery, delivery, and manufacturing. And then looking ahead as well, I think probably you and I both think optimistically about the impact our field can have on medicine. And up until this point, it has made sense to work with disease targets with a very, you know, broad therapeutic window. Uh, if you consider hemophilia, it really doesn't matter what cells secrete it. The more the merrier, as long as, you know, the more bioreactor secreting factor nine or factor eight into the bloodstream, the, the better. Uh, and in addition, um, there's a very broad therapeutic window where anywhere from 20% uh, to 5x normal levels of factor nine are well tolerated, you know, don't cause thrombosis on the high end and, and alleviate the awful symptoms of hemophilia B on the low end. So the more the better uh, has, has really been the approach within the field for that target. As we begin to solve more of those, we're going to start going in, into disease areas where it matters when, where, and how much of a therapeutic payload is expressed. So I think that, uh, you know, ahead of manufacturing, we're going to uh, face some challenges or have some need to develop technologies for a very accurate gene regulation so that uh, as we go after diseases that have a narrow therapeutic window for expression of a product. That makes sense, and uh, it also shows the challenge ahead. So that's uh, certainly uh, an opportunity for talented uh, trainees to come in and help solve these problems, and uh, certainly uh, plenty of uh, futures uh, for talented investigators, which brings me um, to a question for Adam, which is, uh, correct me if I got this wrong, but I, I believe that you performed this uh, exciting study as, as a grad student in, in David's lab, and we just heard about some exciting challenges ahead that maybe uh, you uh, will solve uh, in the future for us. Maybe you can explain a little bit of just, uh, you know, for, for others who are, you know, new in the gene therapy field or thinking maybe in getting into it, how Uh, you know, how how did that all happen? How did you end up in David's lab and and where did you go from there? And, and how, you know, what, what are your plans for the future? Yeah, great question. Um, so I grew up in rural Kansas and and got involved in in basic virology and evolutionary biology research during a joint BSMS program. So undergraduate and master's there. And some of these projects and early work I was involved with, it was, it was very much on the, on the basic research side. And at times it even seemed like this, uh, garage sale of, of, of different projects that were seemingly unrelated. But what, what I realized, uh, was the work that, that Dave was doing with directed evolution and using this as, as an actual approach. Uh, to engineer improved gene delivery vectors that were based on these good viruses, the kind that uh, can can help you. That was really fascinating to me. And it was it was a, a way where I could kind of incorporate all of this experience that I had in virology and evolutionary biology into a coherent uh, graduate program of evolving these these good viral vectors for therapeutic benefit. And so, yeah, I think, I think any kind of, of studies of basic science, that's a great way to start out. And then going into later on in the career, then you can kind of take some of these different aspects and apply them um, to more of these engineering principles, or at least that was definitely the approach that and the path that I took. And then I think, you know, currently I'm, I'm recently finished up my PhD and I'm Uh, completing a, a brief postdoc in Dave's lab to, to finish up some of these academic works. And, and going forward, I really love being on this uh, intersection between basic and translational research. Um, and so taking some of these findings that are generated in universities and with basic research and translating them into medicines that can benefit patients and society. And so I think going forward, I will definitely be kind of on that on that interface throughout my career. Yeah, that's certainly good career advice, I would say. Um, and our field, as, as you and David both, I think, made clear through the, how you explained your study and what it means for gene therapy, the whole field is, is very translational. 
And we're right at that interface between basic discovery and moving things forward. A lot of AVs are obviously in the clinic. Some, um, a number of them are now approved products. And so I would say it's, it's very obvious how these kinds of discoveries and studies will help shape treating patients uh, with, with uh, gene therapy. So, so certainly an exciting time to be part of this. And, um, well, from, I just uh, wanted to also mention that, you know, I'd been a faculty member at, for my career at, at different universities, and, and from time to time, uh, David would be invited as a guest speaker and he'd come in and give a seminar, and, um, and the reaction amongst uh, the starting grad students was pretty much, um, you know, the same uh, afterwards. Oh, you know, I really like to work in his lab. <laughs> so <laughs> he just uh, comes across as so thoughtful, and and um, and and you could tell that he's, you know, that's going to be a, a good lab with a great scientist and and a, um, and, and a good mentor. And and Adam, you're an example for how all this has just beautifully worked out. So, is there anything else that you might you want to add uh, that we? left out or that whether it's about you know gene therapy or careers in gene therapy or or something you know about the av vectors that that we haven't touched upon i'll just mention briefly that adam is one of the most brilliant graduate students i've ever had the joy of working with and it's you know it's people like him who are really pushing the field forward and uh people like him who are the reason that uh innovations continue to happen within our field I'll also mention that uh, doing a graduate program in Dave's lab is a great experience, and it uh, provides you some really amazing opportunities to kind of be involved in that basic research, but always with a, an eye for for things that are going to be really impactful. And I just couldn't have had a better experience. So definitely reach out if you're interested. All right, then I think I want to conclude by uh, thanking both of you not only for participating in this uh, webinar and, and for speaking with me and, you know, voicing your thoughts to the readers of molecular therapy and, and the gene therapy community. But, of course, I want to thank you specifically for publishing this wonderful paper with us and for considering our journal as a, you know, a platform for you to publish and distribute uh, your important work. So thank you so much. Much appreciated. And, um, you know, I wish you all the best, uh, Adam, I wish you all the best for your career. I think you've got a bright one ahead of you. And, uh, of course, I wish David all the best with his research. And uh, in the interest of uh, patients with disease, I obviously hope that this will make a positive impact. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, molecular therapy is a highly esteemed venue for, for people within our community to publish. Thanks for your service to the journal, and I look forward to seeing you at ASGCT.